I can't remember my first memory of injustice, but one of the ones that had the greatest impact on me was when I was about 12 years old and I was in uh, the Northern Territory and I was I walked into a shop and there was an old Aboriginal man standing at the counter and the shopkeeper turned to me and asked me what I wanted and I said, I'm sorry, this gentleman was first. And the shopkeeper said, don't worry, he'll wait. And it just shamed me so deeply to, um, to be in a situation where a man much older than me uh, was overlooked because of his race. Well, I was picked up in Civic one morning when I was 19, I was drunk. They took me across to the Canberra Police Station, put me in the cells to sober up. And while I was in the cells sobering up, next minute two Queemian police officers come in, handcuffed me and said, you're coming with us. And I inquired why and they said, uh, you had a warrant for your arrest outstanding for $850, which I hadn't paid. And I said, where's this from? He said, Arncliffe in Sydney. I said, I've never lived in Arncliffe in Sydney, mate, because it's still coming with us. We don't believe you. They took me to Goldman, maximum security jail, and I was in there for six weeks. Lost my job, lost everything. They finally found out that it was not me by my fingerprints. And I was the same gentleman, same name, same age, but a different fella. My earliest memory of injustice was in grade one. It was the 80s, I was in Mackay, and it was in PE class. I was a little girl with disability who needed some help some help to adapt exercises and sport so I could participate properly. But my PE teacher didn't really care much about this sort of stuff. So while I muddled my way through class after class of trying to work out the best way that I could do things like a star jump from a trampoline to a mattress, he would yell at me and berate me. He would tell me that I was naughty, disobedient. He was going to call my parents. This actually went on for a number of years until in grade four, swimming classes began. And I told my PE teacher that I didn't know how to swim. And he didn't believe me because all the other kids could swim. To punish me because I was a liar, he made me sit in the baby pool on my own with no swimming lessons. Week after week, I sat there on my own, not learning how to swim. Until one day, he was tired of this, tired of this liar. And he dragged me over to the big kid's pool. And despite the fear in my eyes and my face and my heart, he made me get in. And just to really send the message home that he was right and to prove his point, he pushed me, thinking that I was going to start swimming. But I didn't, because I didn't know how to swim. I landed on the bottom of the pool and it was only because a friend in my class knew that I was telling the truth and she saved me. Because of that experience, I never did PE in primary school ever again. I grew up not enjoying sport and not enjoying exercise. Two of the most wonderful things in this world that can bring you healthiness and happiness. And I think that is actually the greatest injustice of all. Maybe I would have been six years old, at the most seven, but I would say six. And a teacher came by and said, I need three people to help me do a job. And so she got the three of us to stand over by, these, by the wall. And 
she went off. And then another monstrous thing who was a teacher said, ah, three more naughty people and came to all. You hadn't done anything at all, but why she, so she told the three of you just to stand there and then why did she walk off? I have no idea. I, I assume she was going to organise whatever it was that the three of us had to do. We were babies, you know. I, I think back on that now, now that I've got grandchildren older than that, you know, because you're too young to kind of even object. My father was a diplomat and so from the age of 16 until 17 I lived in Thailand in Bangkok and I went to the International School of Bangkok and the kids there were incredibly privileged and it was the most extraordinary school but one of the things we used to do in our free time is go out in Pat Pong which is essentially the red light district of Bangkok and my parents didn't really know that that's what we would do we would tell them that we were in other places in perhaps a pub or so forth but actually we would be hanging around the red light district and usually drinking quite a lot and dancing and this one particular night, I was wearing these little black high heels and they started to really, really hurt me. And I went downstairs to try to find a chemist. And I sat down on this brick wall with these band-aids in my hand. And a young Thai girl who I think must have been almost identical in age to me, she sat down next to me and she said to me, did I want help putting the band-aids on? And she actually put the band-aids on for me. And I realized that she was wearing these almost identical shoes to me. And then I had this really awful moment because I also realized that she was there because she was a prostitute and she had most likely been sold into prostitution by her family from one of the very, very poor regions in the north of Thailand. And I just never forget that moment because I realized that life just isn't fair and I had this question of, you know, why am I this privileged white child going to this incredibly prestigious school and this girl has been sold into a life of prostitution and there's really no difference between us. And I think for me that was one of the key moments when I started to really think about social justice and I think eventually led me into becoming a journalist writing about social justice. I grew up in a fairly large regional town in Western Australia in in the early 60s. Um, my father worked at the local abattoir there and um, he worked with some Aboriginal men. Um, often when they broke up for work, the men used to go to the local pub and have a drink. Well, the Aboriginal men, of course, at that stage, because they didn't have what they called a certificate of exemption, they couldn't go into the hotel and drink with the other men. What is a certificate of exemption? We used to call it citizenship. What it meant that they virtually gave the Aboriginal a certificate which says you're a white man, basically. Um, they gave it to Aboriginals who were considered well-behaved and kept their houses properly, kept their children properly, etc. So they gave them this certificate of exemption. So it said, well, you can be treated like a white man, you can, um, you can vote, you can go into a hotel, you can send your kids to school. The other thing, if any of the white men provided them with alcohol, they could be arrested um, for providing alcohol to the Aboriginal men. So they, they were certainly discriminated against, um, you know, unless they had one of these certificates of exemption. They also had to carry it with them at all times and they had to produce it to the police on demand. So if they didn't have it, um, they were charged and, uh, or they could get it revoked and... Um, not get it back. There was no right of appeal, so it was fairly harsh at the time. I remember when I was um, at school, quite little, I would have been maybe 
six or seven and I desperately needed to go to the toilet and the teacher refused to let me go. She just kept saying, no, you can't go, no, you can't go, no, you can't go. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know why, if she thought I was making it up or it was going to be an interruption for her, um, but I needed to go to the toilet so badly that I wet my pants and I remember being really embarrassed and really embarrassed, obviously. And there's a reason that story stuck with me um, as one of injustice was, um, and I think started a lot actually, um, not just in relation to how I interact with children, but for me it was a story that really demonstrates a power imbalance and how easy it is for people who are in positions of power to forget or overlook or even um, maybe even revel in the fact that they have this power that um, there will be people who can't speak back and particularly with children. I've never forgotten what it's like to be a child in, in that situation and I've tried never to forget that because, um, you know, I teach small children um, at a weekend school. I have children myself. Um, and I never want to forget how vulnerable children are in that power imbalance. My earliest recollection of injustice was probably through my schooling system, seeing what some kids would come to school with and what their houses were like. My parents would often volunteer for Vinnie's at their local parish, so all of us kids would come along to their door knocking or hamper hang handouts. We would hear about some people in the community not doing as well as us, and we were encouraged to help out who we could by doing what we could at school fundraisers. I distinctly remember my father walking me to a football game as a kid and seeing some other children and their parents who weren't looking so well. I didn't notice, but my father made a comment about needing to help others when we weren't aware of how lucky we are. Now, at 26, this rings more true than ever.